Hey ya, Dark here. Submit your art in my official Discord server if you want it featured in the next video. The link will be in the description below. Probably. The books have never been a more heated debate than they are now. For those who somehow don't know, there was recently a big debacle over on Reddit involving the canonicity of the books. Are they canon? Do they take place within the universe of the games? Do some of them take place in the games while others are just for fun? Well, recently a Redditor by the name of Active Power Grant claimed to have emailed Scott about the canonicity of the books. As you can see in the video, it seems that Scott responded to the email. That's big news. Not only that, but within it he clarifies that the books are indeed canon and that certain FF stories are within the continuity of the games, while Tales from the Pizza Plex is completely in the continuity of the games. As you can imagine, this would be massive for the community, if only it was Scott. Not long after this was posted, Scott himself has gone on record to say that the email is, in fact, fake. He also went on to say this, Anyone who knows me after all these years should know that this isn't how I would address such a serious topic, so let me take this opportunity to be as clear as possible. Concerning what people are saying about the canonicity of the books, yes, that is correct. This has driven people wild on all sides of the topic. Some people have taken this as hard concrete confirmation that the books are in fact canon, or that they do in fact take place within the continuity of the games. Others have chalked this up to typical Scott Cawthon drawing. On first glance, you might think this is pretty cut and dry. After all, he says the word, yes. But he also says concerning what people are saying about the canonicity of the books, which would infer he's making reference to whatever people are talking about in terms of the books. The issue with that, of course, is that people's opinions on the books vary wildly. You can make the argument that he's referring to the original post made by Active Pomegranate, but you could also make the argument that Active Pomegranate is one person in a vast community of differing opinions. There's no one majority when it comes to how the books are treated. Some think they are within the game verse, others think they aren't, and there's also multiple in-betweens. All that to say, we're talking about the books today. I do want to preface that I don't really have a stake in the debate when it comes to whether or not the books are in the game continuity. If Tales in particular is set in the world of Security Breach, I think that'll be awesome. I I'm not a big fan of Fazbear Frights being in the game's continuity. I think the series has some awesome stories, but the Stitch Wraith epilogues really aren't that great in my opinion. Uh, they also bring back William Afton in the epilogues, which I'm not particularly a fan of. It's been said a hundred times before and I'll say it again. FFPS is the best ending for William Afton and that arc of the story, and UCN is the perfect addendum. All that to say, today we are talking about a specific story within Fazbear Frights titled What We Found. What We Found follows the story of Hudson, a young man working at the soon-to-open horror attraction Fazbear's Fright. For those who aren't familiar with the topic of Fright God, it's basically in reference to who the Night God is in FNAF 3. Fazbear's Fright is the setting that FNAF 3 takes place in, and this story features a version of Fazbear's Fright. Some take this story as confirmation for who the Night God is in FNAF 3, that being Hudson, while others say that Hudson is a parallel for Michael Afton. The reason this debate exists is because, unlike the first two games, FNAF 3 doesn't explicitly tell you who you play as at the end of it. The first two games have a paycheck at the end which gives you the identity of the Night God, while FNAF 3 gives you a newspaper telling you the horror attraction has burned down. To start, let's break down Hudson as a character. When Hudson was young, his father unfortunately took his own life. His mother remarried, but to a man who was much less kind. Hudson's stepfather was named Lewis, and Lewis is an asshole. He was cruel, he was abusive, and he treated Hudson like trash. Lewis is so harsh on Hudson that the poor guy had to get two discs in his spine fused. As the book states, he had a wrist that gave him fits. It hadn't been set right after Lewis crushed it under his boot because Hudson wet himself during a thunderstorm. Page 160. All this to say that Hudson is pretty screwed up, both mentally and physically. He was never able to do any of the sports his friends Duane and Barry participated in, and he wasn't able to pass a physical given to people who want to join the military. Duane and Barry aren't particularly important for this theory. Just know that they are also working at Fazbear's Fright as part of the setup crew bringing in a bunch of Fazbear memorabilia. What is important to know is that Hudson has a very crappy life, clearly. One night when Lewis was being his usual self, the house Hudson and his parents lived in burned down, 
killing his mother and abusive stepfather in the process. It is revealed, or at least implied, towards the end of the story that Hudson did in fact set the house on fire. I say implied because at this point in the story, Hudson is definitely going through the ringer. The story doesn't necessarily specify how long Hudson has been working at the attraction, although we know it was only supposed to be temporary. The place is still being set up with decorations, and when what we found begins, Springtrap hasn't even been brought in yet. I think it's also worth mentioning that Fazbear's Fright in What We Found is somewhat different from the Fazbear's Fright from FNAF 3. Just as an example, in What We Found the story states that the building has a kitchen, which was originally planned to be a fake kitchen. Quote, When Faith and her team first designed it, the kitchen was going to be a replica of one of the pizzeria kitchens, but then management decided they wanted this attraction to be available as a venue for parties. That's when the fake kitchen became a real kitchen. Page 205. Also, if you're wondering why I'm quoting specific parts of the story, it's mostly just to prove that I did in fact read it before making this video, so I do know what I'm talking about. But Doc, just because FNAF 3 doesn't visibly show us a kitchen doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Fair point, but what we found also details the attraction as having a gift shop and other rooms that FNAF 3 just doesn't have. Quote, Hudson paused near the gift shop that sold an amazing assortment of Fazbear merchandise. The store had a little of everything Fazbear related, page 157. This leads us to my first point, which is also one of the main selling points for Hudson being Fright God. Just because Hudson is the Night God in the story does not mean he is also the Night God in the games. If we take the logic that, oh, because he is the God here, in this story, he must be the God in the game, then we'd have to apply that logic to other things as well. It's not something we can just pick and choose when we want it to work. Try applying the aforementioned to step closer. Pete shows a lot of similarities to Mike in the games, one being very directly referenced within that story and the Survivor logbook. I think some people, in the aftermath of the Mimic, look at the books and sometimes take them at face value when, for better or for worse, that is not always the case. I'm going to be controversial and say that parallels exist in FNAF. You can burn me at the stake now. This might seem like another tangent, but this is important to the overall point. The Silver Eyes introduced to us Charlotte and Henry Emily, characters who soon become important outside of this book. It also gave us our villain's name a la William Afton, but very clearly all of these characters are different in the games compared to their book counterparts. Henry, in The Silver Eyes, unalives himself early on in the book timeline. Not to mention that, as far as we're aware, there are no Charlie robots that Henry made within the games. This all to say that these characters that were first properly introduced within the Silver Eyes are parallels to their counterparts within the games. I'm not trying to say that the books, specifically Frights and Tales, don't slash can't happen within the continuity of the games, but I don't think Matt Pet and Prague is canon either. Let's go back to Hudson and his experience working at Fazbear's Fright. The story only consists of two nights, although admittedly Hudson was only working there before the story began. It's also worth noting that he is not specifically the Night God, he actually works both days and nights. However, it's the second day of the story when Springtrap is brought into the building, and of course that is the night when everything takes a turn for the worst for Hudson. Well, it gets even worse at least. That actually brings us to our next point, that being the hallucinations Hudson experiences on the second night. This is another point of evidence people use for Hudson being the FNAF 3 Night God. However, there is a very clear distinction between what we see in FNAF 3 and what Hudson sees in what we found. Hudson doesn't see the phantoms. He sees objects from around the attraction move and attack him. Quote, it was Chica again. The Chica head attached to his shoulder, arm, and hand. And the hand was hanging on to Hudson's foot as if his foot was the most important thing in the world. Page 200. Note that it's specifically Chica's head, her arm, and shoulder, and a hand. Hudson also hallucinates Springtrap moving around the building and attacking him. But in reality, Springtrap is bolted to a wall the entire story. Quote, Squaring his shoulders, he forged ahead, turning down the hall where the animatronic was hanging at the... The animatronic was hanging on the wall, just where Barry and Dwayne had left it. Page 218. Again, I'm quoting the book just to prove I know what I'm talking about. Moving on, Hudson also hallucinates his abusive stepdad, although not quite either. He hallucinates what his stepdad Lewis used to belittle him with, you're nothing, you're less than nothing, so on and so forth. But often these things accompany Springtrap, as if the decaying animatronic reminds him of Lewis. Actually, Hudson straight up hallucinates Springtrap saying what Lewis used to say to him, but all the while Springtrap is actually still narrowed to a wall the entire story. That brings us to the end of what we found. 
where Hudson hides in one of the industrial furnaces in the attraction's fake-slash-real kitchen. He thinks it's the safest place he can hide. Mind you, at this point in the story, the poor guy has been beaten, bruised by his own mind. A little earlier in the story, he hallucinated Springtrap stabbing him, but it wasn't Springtrap. It was him. Quote, Hudson looked over his shoulder to see how close his pursuer was. He slid to a stop. No one was behind him. The hallway was empty, and its walls were still. Well, it wasn't completely empty. A bloody butcher knife lay on the floor near where Hudson was when the animatronic slashed him. Or did it? Had he imagined it? Page 215 to 216. Now that he's locked himself in an industrial furnace, you can imagine what happens next. The story heavily implies here that Hudson was the one who set fire to his childhood home. Quote, Hudson hunched over in the fireplace, and he listened for Lewis as he looked at Lewis's later. When had Hudson taken it? He didn't remember, but it was his now. Hudson could feel Lewis's lighter in his hand. He could feel his thumb on the little starter wheel. Flames started crawling up the curtains next to the fireplace. Page 224. As you can imagine, the industrial furnace turns on with Hudson inside. I'm not really sure how these stoves turn on as I have never operated one, but I imagine they don't just automatically activate when something is placed inside. So either Hudson turned the oven on before climbing in, or something outside did. To be fair, again, I'm not skilled in the art of big stove, but at the end of the day, the outcome remains the same. Now, it's important to note that although Hudson gets burnt to a crisp in this thing, the building itself does not burn down to ruin by the end of the story. As a matter of fact, when Barry and Duane arrive in the morning, the attraction is completely fine. It hasn't burned down like it does in the games. Let's put that aside and talk about Mike slash FNAF 3. In FNAF 3, the night god works for six nights before Phasma's fright burns to the ground. However, by brightening up the image at the end of the game, it's revealed Springtrap has survived the fire. Also, as you might have guessed, Springtrap is on the move throughout most of the game, borrowing night one because he hasn't been brought into the building yet. Throughout the game, the protagonist experiences ghostly phantoms whose existences are still debated to this day. Some say they are just hallucinations, possibly caused by the fact this place has ventilation that would never pass an OSHA inspection. Some say the phantoms are actual ghosts, though. Possibly the forms the missing children have taken now that their original prisons are mere decoration. What they are doesn't necessarily matter, but how they appear does. Notice how a majority of the phantoms appear as their FNAF 2 counterparts. Freddy, Foxy, Mangle, and Balloon Boy all appear as they did in that game, albeit with a new coat of poop paint. The standout phantom is Chica, who appears as her FNAF 1 counterpart, although still with the same code of crap everyone else has. Now let's take a look around the attraction itself. There's FNAF 1 Freddy, Chica, Bonnie, and Foxy, and the remains of the toys sitting in a box in a corner. There's also the puppet's mask from FNAF 2 hanging in a hall, and the puppet itself does appear as a Phantom 2 in the game, but the puppet itself, as it was in FNAF 2, also appears in that same hallway. Using what we found as a basis, it's more likely that the phantoms we see are in fact hallucinations our protagonist experiences. However, that being said, our protagonist is having hallucinations of animatronics not as their remains are, but as they were. He doesn't see FNAF 1 Freddy, he sees Withered Freddy. Chica's head is sitting in the hallway, but the security guard is able to hallucinate her as she was in FNAF 1 in her entirety. Not only that, but he's familiar with Balloon Boy, Mangle, and the Puppet. Furthermore, the foam fo 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 Furthermore, the opening phone call says this. Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. I promise it'll be a lot more interesting this time. Now you could take this as, you know, we were here last week and we we're back for work the next, but FNAF in terms of the games have never really worked like that. Generally speaking, these games last about a week or even less. In FNAF 1, Mike works at Freddy's for a week before getting fired. In FNAF 2, Jeremy works there for nearly a week before being switched over to the day shift. Then Fritz Smith works there for a single night before getting fired. FNAF 4 has the most nights in all of the series with 8 nights. Though 2020 mode doesn't yield any lore, and it's night 7 when the infamous box appears. Point being that I'm pretty confident in night 1 being our character's first night working at Fazbear's Fright. But I realize that's subject to opinion. Moving on to a little supportive evidence, the Amazing Survivor Logbook. Throughout the logbook, there are illustrations of the FNAF 3 office. And more interestingly, Foxy is always depicted as the night guard throughout said logbook. As you can imagine, that's interesting when you consider Foxy Bro from FNAF 4, 
is believed to be Mike Lafton. Now, my opinion on when the survival logbook takes place has fluctuated. Previously, I mentioned I think it could take place during FNAF 1, which I still think is a possibility, but I can also see the argument for FNAF 3. Either way, I think it's interesting that Foxy is depicted as the security guard and that the FNAF 3 office is the office illustrated throughout the book. That leads me to my next conversational point. Who fits the requirements for FNAF 3? Let's get it out of the way. No, I don't think it's Hudson. We have no evidence to suggest Hudson is familiar with FNAF 2. And even within what we found, he doesn't experience hallucinations that line up with the phantoms from FNAF 3. However, does that automatically mean it's Mike? All signs point to yes, however, a topic of debate is if Mike even worked at the FNAF 2 location in 1987. The general consensus is that Jeremy Fitzgerald is most likely not Michael Lafton, and is instead a different night guard. And it's also important to note again that Phantom Chica appears as her FNAF 1 self. There's an argument to be made that Jeremy would be familiar with most of the phantoms he experiences, as he did work as the guard in the majority of FNAF 2. And if you believe Jeremy is the body bully from FNAF 4, that lends it a little more credence. However, we have nothing to say he's ever been to the FNAF 1 location. That brings us to Fritz Smith, the man who only worked a single night at FNAF 2 before being fired for the exact same reasons Michael Afton is fired from FNAF 1. Again, popular theory suggests that Fritz Smith is another alias used by Michael Afton while working at Freddy's. This would allow Michael to be familiar not only with the FNAF 1 animatronics because, as mentioned previously, he worked at the FNAF 1 location, but also the FNAF 2 animatronics. It's also worth mentioning that Michael would obviously have been around when the 1985 Freddy's was open, a location which we know opened in 1983 based on these coins from Help Wanted slash Security Breach. So yes, I believe Michael Afton is the FNAF 3 Night Guard. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave your own thoughts or opinions below. Once again, I really enjoyed talking about this, and I'd love to talk about some more popular theories in the fandom. So far, we've talked about Molten MCI and now Fright Guard, and there are a lot of really interesting theories out there that have some really awesome deep dives. Not only that, but this was the first time I, well, first real theory where I got to sit down and read one of the Fazbear Fright stories in order to do proper research. Admittedly, I haven't read all of the stories yet, Mostly because I've been deliberately putting it off until I had a proper reason to, and of course because I've been busy. After all, I didn't want to read the books only to formulate a theory based on them months later, because knowing me I would have gotten all the important details mixed up. My memory is crap. That all said, my favorite part about doing this is the conversation it opens up. So again, if you have any thoughts or theories of your own, feel free to drop them below. Thank you for watching, and peace out.